104.7, The Cave, plays pure classic rock. Here today with Russ Tiedland. And uh, Russ, what branch of the military did you serve? United States Air Force Reserve. Oh, cool. And uh, during what years? Uh, 1989 to 2001. Oh, wow. I went in, I enlisted at 32. Uh-huh. Wow. Um, my first unit was a 78 aerial port squadron during Desert Storm. Uh-huh. And I was loading the C-130s, the one the 141s and the C-5s, uh-huh. and then after Desert Storm, I crossed train, spent the last nine years as a medic with the 442nd Medical Squadron out of Whiteman Air Force Base. Oh, cool. So you're up in Kansas City area then? Yes, sir. Um, so what and why would anyone go in at 32? I would just moved home from California, and finding a job was a little difficult, uh-huh. and my father served in World War II. And I just felt a need to serve my country. I love my country. And so at 32, I went in. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. When I went through basic training, all the, the young kids were making wagers on who was going to drop through PT first. Yeah. And when I didn't, and they did, it was it was a good choice for yeah, me. Yeah, that's I awesome. Absolute, I absolutely loved it. I've got the most ab- utmost respect for that, especially at that age. I'm I'm 33, and I don't think I can. I work out every day for about 30, 45 minutes, and it about kills me. And I can't even imagine wanting to make that kind of a life choice at 32. But I think it's it's not only admirable, but um, uh, it's very very cool that you did that. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. Um, and a lot of the times we always talk about how most if not all guys that are in the military don't have a choice they sign up whether it's they need to go to college and they can't pay for it or but you know that's your your decision to do that is pretty pretty amazing especially at that age it's incredible i you know my at the time my wife and my girls were young and and we needed a steady income and i and i knew that i could do that and Mm -hmm. then when i got home i would have my once a month and then two weeks out of the summer, which is going to give me a steady paycheck and gave me some life skills. And then as a transportation, I could have gone to work for the airport, but I didn't. I went to nursing school instead, and then I became a realtor. But it just, I, I watched my father. I watched the vets now. Those who signed chose to go. Mm-hmm. I love the Constitution. I love our flag. I love our country. I would do it again. I was getting ready to go back in after 2001, after 9-11. I dropped a lot of weight. I had my papers going back to my old unit. I just lost my mom on Valentine's Day. Oh, man. And my dad said, you've done, you've done your time. Would you stay home with me? And I made a choice that turned out the best because I lost dad two years later. Yeah, that's good that you got to spend that last time yeah, with him. That's, it was. That, yeah, that's, that's an incredible story. That's incredible. So you went through nursing school. Did you do any n- kind of nursing after you got out? or anything Well, like I, I didn't finish nursing school be, simply because I scored a 90% on a drug calculation test, and they wanted a 95. And so um, that, that, that's a whole different story. There, 5% there, of a grade. There, there was three, uh, three males in the nursing school, and, and they found different ways to get all three of us out. And, and, wow, and, really? Yeah, they did. And you hear you hear all the time that there's such a shortage of nurses. We can't find it. We don't have enough. It's it's the growing field. We need them. We need them. We need them. And, and I, then they'd push you away like that. And wow. I ju- and I'd just gotten out because I was basically an LPN, but I didn't want to go to Florida or California to, to uh, what they call, uh, oh, slept out on it. Uh-huh. And so I became a phlebotomist. I worked for the Red Cross and I worked for CBCO. I love doing that. Yeah. I mean, sick and th- I go to high school drives and yeah. I would just have way too much fun with some of the jocks <laughs> sticking them with needles. Uh, but then I got tired of getting up at three o'clock in the morning, yeah. making all these drives. Yeah. And then I sold some property on Fairgrove and I decided I wanted to be a realtor. And I've been a realtor for the last, I'm in my ninth year now. Oh, nice. That's really cool. That's awesome. That's really cool. What a cool story. 32 going in. That's you know, you hear these kids that are 17 and they're ready to roll. And then, you know, I think sometimes kids, I definitely know that I wasn't mature enough to 18 to make that kind of a decision. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. And I think at that point in your life, you definitely are mature enough to make well, that kind it, of a decision. It, it was interesting because when, when I went through basic training, all these kids, they were just uh, running their mouths and everything else. Old and, man. And, stuff, it, it, well, oh, yeah, call me grandpa, oh, which yeah. is okay. Yeah. But as we started doing the PT and I wasn't falling down, and I was hanging with them. They're going, wow, why'd you do this? And I'm going, because I, A, I needed to. B, I want, A, I wanted to serve my country. B, I needed to. And I said, and so what they do is they, 
in basic training in San Antonio, they, they give you not enough time. They give you too much stuff to do, not enough time to do it. And I saw what they were doing. They were trying to break you down, yeah. and then they're going to rebuild you up. Uh -huh. And so these kids were going, what are you doing? I said, just listen to what they're doing. Think about what they're asking you to do. They get in your face. They're calling you names. They're trying to find your breaking point. Don't break. And my drill sergeant, when he'd come up to me, it was very hard for me not to laugh because his hat would hit me in the chin. And it was all I had to do was I could just bop him on the head. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm just trying to keep a straight face and some of these kids came in for the wrong reason and they got and they got left oh, out yeah. we, we had one young man that got we were in two and a half weeks and he tried to commit suicide with oh, a fork wow. but the problem but mike the problem was he tried to do it by stabbing himself in the shoulder with a fork and towel so he just wanted to get out yeah he yeah. just wanted to get out yeah. and so it was um it's not for everybody no it is just not for everybody you've got you've got to understand that they're going to break you down you got to understand that they want you to work as a team mm -hmm. and as one unit you help each other you have your battle buddies you work together and i had no problem doing that none i mean it it, it frustrated me oh yeah it frustrated me when they tell you one thing and then they do another. Mm -hmm. When they tell you you can't swear, you can't say anything like the that. And then they call you the next yeah. word. Is, yeah. They call you, and it was hard for me not to laugh when yeah, they did yeah, that because yeah. they, they said you got to have integrity. So I called them out yeah. on it one time, and the guy said, "Russ, don't do that." Yeah. And I said, "You tell us one thing, and then you do another." And I said, "I know what you're doing. You're trying to break us down. That's fine." Yeah, yeah. And so and and so they left me alone pretty much. Yeah. That's cool. Did you get to do anything cool overseas or see anything cool? Well, or? in Dover, Delaware, it, uh, when we were sending stuff over to Iraq during yeah. Desert Storm, there was just all kinds of stuff that we were loading. Uh, we were working 24-7, um, two on, two off. Didn't see a lot there. And then I, when we got home, I went to Cuba, to Guantanamo oh. Bay. Wow. I was in Guantanamo Bay for three months. Oh, wow. Working with the Navy on a joint task force. And in Gitmo, they have the Cuban refugees were coming in. And some of the stories that they came in, they were coming in on rafts that were made out of uh, paper plates oh, and one buys in shark infested water. And it, tough stories. And then, and then we, we'd work in the emergency, I'd work in the ER, and we'd go out to the camps. If they were criminals, they would go, and there is a camp x ray. We need to keep. Gitmo alive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We put them in Camp X Ray and send them back to Cuba. The other ones were coming in. We give them full physicals, mental health, give them job applications, the whole nine yards to come in. And I saw a lot of different things that in the medical field that were probably not appropriate for here. Uh -huh. And we had one lady that thought she was having a heart attack, and so we went in on that. And I looked over at her and her eyes opened. I'm going, she's not having a heart attack. So I had to go through an interpreter. And yes. And so I took a, a smelling salt. And if you're really out and you snap that smelling salt, it's not going to wake you up. Uh -uh. So I snapped it. And she woke up, found out she was just having menstrual cramps and she couldn't deal with the pain. Wow. We had another guy that wanted, and this was not, understand, this was not a prison camp. It was yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a guy that, and they had nice tents, hardback floors, concrete floors, come and go as they please. One guy got so frustrated that he took a, a straight edge and cut both Achilles tendons on his heels. Just to get out. Just to get out. And then, then we talk all, about desperation. Oh, yeah. Jesus. But That's crazy. You, you make lifelong friends, your brothers in arms, you never leave anybody behind. You just don't. And you have to work with the Navy, um, which is. Really good. I enjoyed every bit of it. And then I got to go to Guam. Yeah. And when Mount Pinaturbo blew up, uh -huh. I was in Guam, and we were unloading planes and stuff and bringing all the Filipinos into Guam. You're not the first person that I've talked to that was over there when that happened. And that was, I mean, and people here in the States, they don't, they, in Mississippi or even here in Missouri, think it's humid. Uh -huh. No. I, I, can, I can live with this. I could go to Florida not, and live with that. No. Close. We were changing shirts every 30 it's minutes out there. Close. At 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. It was, and, and Guam is only an island 30 miles by 30 miles. And it just, um, it's miserably humid. <laughs> and, that's a, and that's at midnight, too. Yeah, it is. It doesn't is. matter what time it, it doesn't. is. It doesn't. Absolutely. That's incredible. Have you thought now that we can, I guess, go back to Cuba? Have you ever thought about going back? Check it out. Um, I'd, go, I'd go back to Gitmo again. Yeah. Uh, I don't necessarily 
think we should be going back to Cuba because they're laughing at us right now, and I, I, I believe that it was a mistake uh -huh. because they don't like us. Yeah. Uh, they don't like democracy. They want control. Uh, so I don't think I would ever voluntarily go to Havana. Okay. I would go to Gitmo, but and just see how much that's changed. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I'd voluntarily go back to Cuba. Yeah, I wouldn't. Gotcha. Huh. Interesting. Well, um, I really appreciate you sitting down with me and talking with me today, Russ. And uh, thank you very much for your service. Incredible story, man. Thank you. I it was my honor, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. One hundred four point seven. The Cave plays pure classic rock.